good afternoon, good morning, or even good evening, depending on where you're coming in from. We're here today to talk about improving application, database protection, and database performance using Flash. Today's webinar is sponsored by Violin Memory and was presented by Actual Tech Media in concert with Violin Memory. The people you'll be hearing from today are wide and varied and extremely knowledgeable. We're first going to hear from a gentleman named Bill Evans. He is a Violin customer and he's the Vice President for Information Technology at Pharrell Gas. Bill, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. We're also going to hear from Saeed from Violin. Saeed is the Senior Vice President for Worldwide Field Operations and the past Senior Vice President for Strategy and Product Management. Saeed, thank you for joining us today as well. Glad to be here. Thank you. And my name is Scott D. Lowe. I am a partner at Actual Tech Media, and we are happy to have Violin here today to talk about some things that are happening in the, in the flash storage space. And even more excited that we have a customer on the line to talk about real-world use cases, which are really critically important to understand. We're going to start today with a very short definition discussion so we can make sure that we level set the playing field for Bill Evans, who will then talk about his violin memory deployment at Feral Gas. We'll then hear from Saeed to talk about violin, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A, which I'll moderate, where you can ask any of the presenters any question you desire, and we'll bring them to the audience, or bring them to the moderators for the audience to hear answers. So let's start with some definitions. When we think about storage, and we think about flash storage in particular, we can really start to rethink the way that we handle the data center. And we're trying to go towards one overarching goal that I'll discuss in just a second. Today, we're going to focus on database consolidation, where we can enable multiple databases to run on a single array. Back in the days of all disk, which I like to call the bad old days, we couldn't always do this because storage performance would not always lend itself well to enabling consolidation of databases uh, on a single array. So we had to have multiple systems out there to handle these sorts of things. That can't continue. That's not scalable. That's not economical. That's not efficient. We also need to have acceleration in place from a database perspective. We have to have optimum workload performance for every application that we're running on the array. That's critical. The business is not going to stand for workloads that are subpar from a performance perspective. And this is one of the areas in which all flash is really critically important. The benefits here that we're going to talk about today are the ability to consolidate multiple storage silos into a single platform and decrease costs while increasing performance. Those used to be mutually exclusive goals back in the days of disk. Today with Flash, it's not impossible. In fact, with all Flash, we can really begin to reset data center economics. And that's what we really need to do as we move forward in the world of the data center. And I'm now pleased to turn over the keyboard and mouse control to Bill Farrell, uh, Bill Evans, I believe, uh, Vice President of Information Technology at Farrell Gas. Bill, take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me today. I would uh, like to share some of the information about Farrell Gas first and then about our experience with Bio. Muted. Farrell uh, Gas is, uh, was actually began as a mom and pop propane operation back in 1939 in Atchison, Kansas, and is now one of the nation's, well, is the nation's second largest propane retailer. And we delivered over 762 million gallons on the retail side in FY15. <clears throat> one of our companies is Blue Rhino, which is probably a more recognizable trademark around the country, as uh, you may have one of their, grill, uh, their tanks in your grill on the patio. We have 45,000 selling locations throughout the country at places such as Lowe's and Walmart and other retail operations. Uh, it's also one of the nation's leading providers in outdoor living uh, accessories, such as uh, fireplaces and grilling tools and things like that. Uh, Bridger is a recent acquisition. Last summer, we acquired the uh, Bridger Logistics company that is one of the nation's leading providers in crude oil logistics, uh, delivering or hauling crude from the well to the refinery over uh, long-haul transport in trucks, rail, 
pipeline, and barge. We have operations in 14 states and all major U.S. crude oil production regions, including the Permian, Bakken, and Eagle Board. And in, in 2012, before we became acquainted with them, they were ranked number four in Inc.'s 500 list of fast-growing companies, private companies in America. <clears throat> well, uh, we were faced with a storage replacement situation at Feral Gas. This is something that comes up every few years or so uh, for everybody. Uh, in our case, we were running on EMC storage and our lease was coming up and at those at the time that leases come to expiration point, we always take time to evaluate whether it's best for us to buy the equipment out, extend the lease, or to replace the equipment. And what we were, uh, what we had decided to do is that with the, excuse me, the change in technology available to us and also with the maintenance costs escalating into the later years on a EMC storage product, we decided to look out at other options for us uh, to replace the storage. What we had was a uh, complex tiered in solution uh, which required constant management and we, because of that, and not being able to find uh, someone to manage it for us internally, we outsourced that, uh, that management process to help us keep the data aligned in the right places and spread across the right tiers of storage. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, <coughs> we also had uh, in our process, it to our test dev and our disaster recovery location, we were keeping databases synchronized through log shipping and then replaying the logs on the far end. So it was a bit of a cumbersome process to maintain our data protection in the case of an emergency and also to just create test and development environments. As we looked through uh, the options to us, we worked with a third party uh, assistant who brought to us a number of different options to look at and helped us uh, <clears throat> wade through the many options available to us. Since we had EMC in place, it was uh, one of the choices that we decided to look at again. We also uh, narrowed the field uh, down to IBM and Violin. As we evaluated several products, we had to narrow the field to make a final selection, so we eliminated different uh, providers and different equipment for different reasons along the way. <clears throat> but these three fit into our budget with the configurations that they offered here. So uh, budget was a, a constraint, but what we found is that in within that constraint, the violin product uh, proved to be a, a very good option for us. In fact, uh, improving our environment uh, tremendously, not only in performance, but in ease of management. And this slide just shows a few of the criteria that we use. <clears throat> I thought uh, a few of the highlights that would uh, show the comparison between the different products. And what we've done is highlight the leading uh, result in each of the criterion in green. And as you look at the screen, you can see that most of the uh, positive results were in the violin column, although IBM did fare well in a couple of places as well. <clears throat> so as we went through this, uh, as you look down at the bottom, the, the last uh, factor there was a um, price performance comparison that we did in, in dollars per IOPS. <laughs> and as uh, as it turned out, violin had a superior performance and price uh, for us. And so it did a very nice job of offering us what we were looking for in the performance category, as well as well within our budget uh, 
for the needs that we had. Along with that, we were pretty impressed with the single pane of glass to manage the hundreds of arrays that uh, if we were to grow that big, we would manage. But uh, in our case, we have four devices. But even with that, it made it very simple so that we could insource that management again. So we did make our selection on violin for the capacity, performance, and low cost. Their storage environment, with all the storage visible and manageable in a single console, made it much easier for us <coughs> to work with it than we had been used to with the EMC. And as I mentioned, we were able to bring that back in-house and now manage it ourselves again. So our total cost of ownership was reduced uh, by lowering the initial purchase price as well as uh, removing the third-party management service that we had. And also, since we use co-location facilities, it reduced our footprint. In this particular case, uh, because of the technology leap forward that's happened since our last purchase, we removed uh, essentially two floor tiles worth of uh, storage out of each of the two data centers that we replaced it in and, and put in place three U worth of storage, to, which has a greater amount of storage, better performance, and obviously a much smaller footprint. And then the ongoing support and maintenance is lower than what we were experiencing in the EMC world. So it was a very positive thing for us in that perspective. <clears throat> we were able to double our capacity with the same budget that we had and ended up in the smaller footprint. We uh, were able, uh, <clears throat> we will be instituting the two-way replication between the data centers that will get us out of our log shipping that we've been doing. We're still in the process of migrating all of the SQL Server databases onto the storage platform so we don't have this in place yet but we're headed down that path, which will make life a lot easier for us in the long run from that perspective. <clears throat> we moved from the three-tier storage of the uh, flash, fiber channel, and SATA into the single high-performance uh, flash tier on the violin FSP. That uh, really contributes heavily to our ability to manage it well instead of uh, cherry picking uh, high use data uh, data tables and applications and sorting out which ones get the premier storage and the fastest response we're able to put everything in one level performance category and a high performance category uh, so that all of our applications are receiving the benefits of <clears throat> the high performance storage that we have now. Um, we brought IT operations from recently acquired company recently, uh, the Bridger Logistics Company. When we acquired them, they had outsourced or as they grew from a small company, nothing up to where they were, they had outsourced all of their computing in a third-party provider environment. <clears throat> and when we acquired them, we looked for opportunities, of course, to merge together our infrastructures and look for savings opportunities. And one that uh, proved to be very uh, positive for us was to take all of their computing operations in-house uh, into our data center and turn off the meter on the outsource provider, which turned out to be about a million dollars in annual savings. And because we had moved to the uh, violin storage platform, we had new capacity, which made it possible to do that, but also <clears throat> we had no performance issues or concerns moving it one from one provider to another. And in fact, since moving, the Bridger folks have identified a few of their um, slow performing reports that they had in the past, and they are now seeing much better performance on those two to three times faster in our environment, which we can only attribute to the 
improved uh, performance on our storage end. Uh, another application in-house <clears throat> that has had a big impact is uh, we have what we consider one of our lifeblood applications. It's our routing application that allows us to route our uh, retail vehicles. We have about 2,300 vehicles in the fleet and we route those every day to uh, have them deliver to approximately, well, more than 30,000 stops each day. As we do that, it takes quite a bit of compute power and processing to work through all the different scenarios. It's essentially the traveling salesman problem where you try to find the best route for the truck to follow and to make the most efficient deliveries each day. And we have 2,300 of those vehicles to do every day. Well, that application is running four times faster at night, which does a couple of things for us. Uh, one, certainly, that it allows us to throw more factors at it and allow it to do an even better job at the routing uh, efficiencies. But also, uh, since our production processing would run all, the, all through the night and wrap up at about 5 in the morning, which would be just in time to start uh, getting the routes um, rolling out as the trucks are ready to roll at that time in the morning on the East Coast. We, <clears throat> we now, uh, if we have any problems with production, have uh, a much larger window of recovery opportunity. Uh, we recently had an event where uh, our routes didn't get out in time and we had several drivers waiting for us to get the problem fixed, run the, the uh, production cycle to completion and get the routes delivered. So they spent most of the morning just waiting instead of out driving and delivering, which created a lot of overtime costs for us. So there's a direct financial impact to us in our uh, overtime charges, but also to our delivery reliability to our customers. Now, <clears throat> We've had an event uh, since moving to the violin where uh, a problem occurred in the evening and we were able to resolve it and have production running again uh, so quickly that it was still done before 2 in the morning. So not, the morning routes went out without a hitch and no problems uh, affecting the deliveries at all. We are also uh, in the process of developing the plan to consolidate, um, well, during acquisition processes over the years, we had inherited a data center as part of that. So we have three data centers right now, and we have been working to build the infrastructure over time to make it possible for us to uh, consolidate down to two. And one of the linchpins in that is our storage. <clears throat> and this move to the violin storage is one of the key factors that will allow us to go ahead and move to that com uh, consolidated data center and leaving us with just two. What we'll be creating too, <clears throat> because we can leverage this on our storage platform, is an active passive environment with production running in both uh, data centers. And we have multiple companies that run multiple different applications. <laughs> and it's uh, not going to be something where we put production for one company in two different data centers running simultaneously. We are just laying this out so that we can have the capacity to recover quickly to an alternate data center. <laughs> what this will allow us to do is to keep replicated copies of our databases and virtual machines in opposite data centers so that if we had an impact to our production environment, we could migrate the data or just take advantage of the data that's there and the virtual machines that are there in a matter of minutes to bring up the application and continue running. Uh, as of today, if we had an outage like that, we would need to take uh, hours to do, and if we had a great, uh, a large outage, it could extend into a couple of days in recovering all of the applications. So 
So we're viewing this as an opportunity for us to shore up our disaster recovery as well as making it easier on us to do maintenance and to accommodate uh, minor outages. For example, if instead of uh, scheduling a time to take it down production and then uh, make the updates, we can move production to the opposite data center and run it from there while we're making the updates on the production environment. And then when complete, we can migrate it back. So that gives us a lot of flexibility and also allows us to change up the mix of applications between data centers to balance out the performance requirements across the enterprise. And from that, that was what I wanted to share. If there is any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. Unmuted. Bill, we're going to take questions at the very end. Um, I would like to make sure the audience okay. is aware of um, the questions control panel uh, and the go to webinar control panel. Um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers today, please use the questions pane in the, uh, the go to webinar control panel um, and ask the questions as they come up so you don't forget. And we will take as many questions as possible at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the event. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Saeed from uh, Violin. Saeed, you're up. Thank you, Scott. Um, pleasure to be here and talk about violin uh, a little bit. I first want to thank Bill for uh, sharing the story of the violin success uh, and, and how uh, I think uh, I'm really excited with the partnership that we have with Bill and his team and helping them to be instrumental in the success of feral gas. So, so with that, I wanted to kind of go and, and talk a little bit more from the violin perspective around uh, the old flash array market and, and how we've been addressing it. Um, so I think the first thing uh, that comes to mind is that all flash arrays are just too compelling. Um, and, and the way we look at this is that although um, this, the cost of storage has been continuously going down every year, um, data has continued to explode in the enterprise. And, from, from, and the two have been actually equalizing each other out roughly. So from an enterprise spend perspective, it appears like you know, you're kind of spending the same amount of money on storage every year. But what's happening on the back end, and, and, and this is where I think really the, the, the challenges are uh, starting to kind of mount for a lot of enterprises, is that the amount of people, energy, and floor space that is needed to run that storage is, is, has exploded. Um, we've seen customers that, are spend, that have more than half of their data center now being occupied by storage arrays uh, and, and systems. Um, and really what we see is that flash stores resets this entire challenge or, or, and resets the data economics uh, massively by reducing the resources needed uh, that are, uh, need to, to meet the ever-increasing demand uh, in the enterprise. And as, as Bill talked a little bit about, I mean, obviously one element is reducing the cost in the, in the data center and the economics, but at the same time, the performance of flash is also very compelling that it's transformative for a lot of enterprises where they're able to make faster decisions, be able to run tighter deadlines, and actually overall be more competitive and more successful. So when you kind of look at uh, all flash arrays, there's different all flash arrays in the market, and, and it's very clear that not all flash arrays are created equal. Um, the way we look at it from a valent perspective is that first and foremost is we've built, we're one of those all flash arrays, one of the few that are actually not built around SSDs. We do not use solid state drives. We build actually a purpose-built architecture that helps us to actually unlock the full potential of flash. We view SSDs as a transitional technology for, to help um, uh, flash to be introduced from and as transitioning away from disk to flash. But we think that longer term, actually, um, SSDs do not unlock all the potential of flash. So when we set out and shipped the first all-flash array in the world, it was already from that point onwards a non-SSD-based architecture. And that architecture has given us consistent low latency and predictable performance regardless of the type of workload or environment that is put on the array. Um, it has also allowed us to actually create a pretty simple system, very easy to manage. Um, and Bill talked a little bit about the single pane of glass ability to, to, to manage multiple arrays, which is driven by the simplicity in the architecture of the system. We furthermore, as more and more data is being put on the arrays, it's very critical to have maximum data protection, not only to be able to take snapshots, but be able to replicate, mirror, and create very highly available architectures. 
And then as uh, Flash has been moved from not only database workloads and being adopted in other workloads like virtualized environments, et cetera, the ability to do inline deduplication and compression is critical. It allows to bring down the cost of Flash dramatically by able to store more data on, on a smaller amount of physical Flash. And we've seen this as a technology that really is, is helping to continuously move customers faster from disk to flash as they refresh their uh, storage environments. And finally, coming back to the architecture of the, of the system, um, the ability to flash as a technology has a limited amount of writes that it can take. Um, and an, a system that is actually looking not on per SSD, but looking at it from a global pool of, of flash uh, dies is able to actually maximize the endurance of uh, a system in, in a data center, regardless of the type of write environment or type of uh, workload you're running, which allows you to actually prolong the life uh, of, of flash arrays in the, uh, in the deployment dramatically. So the Valen uh, pro portfolio uh, we, we bring is called the Flash Storage Platform. We have different products engineered for different type of use cases. We have the Flash Storage Platform 7250, which is engineered for capacity-oriented workloads, uh, very oriented for virtualized environments and other workloads that take advantage of inline DDoP and compression. Um, on, then we have the Flash Storage Platform 7300, which is really a primary storage product oriented to mul uh, support multiple and mixed type of workloads on a single uh, platform. Um, and then we have the Flash Storage Platform 7600, which is a performance flagship, uh, which delivers very high uh, IOPS, very low latency, and, and can take any type of workload uh, that requires instantaneous low latency responses. And then finally, we have the Flash Storage Platform 7700, which is a scale smart product that allows us to actually scale the architecture in terms of capacity and performance as needed um, and allows you to really create an, a, a solution that will grow as more and more data gets put on and seamlessly add more capacity uh, and support very highly available architectures. So from a, a software perspective, which I think is right now the kind of what we see a lot of customers focus on as part of adopting Flash at scale, it is coming down to the ability to provide application consistent snapshots, the ability to provide asynchronous replication, synchronous mirroring, stretch cluster, the ability to non-disruptively scale the array and add more capacity, ability to pool capacity across multiple shelves to create a larger namespace and a larger ability to support many lines for different type of applications and servers, the ability to turn on and off DDoP and compression, um, and the ability to really support thick and thin lines at a very high performance for those tier zero type of workloads. And finally, the ability to, uh, to bring in data transparently from any third-party array into a violin array seamlessly without interrupting operation are all part of a software portfolio that we bring to the table. Um, and all of this is part of a single integrated operating system across all platforms. Um, and with that, we get one platform that's very easy to manage, does not have put customers in a position that will have to make compromises. And, and customers can start really from different starting points. If they're looking for performance initially from a flash use case perspective, they would straight want to go to primary storage or they want to start from a capacity workload or virtualized workload environment. Um, all of them can be starting points and over time the system can continue to evolve and grow and, and, and support more different type of workloads. So um, there's obviously many vendors in this space. Uh, we believe from a violin perspective that we're leading in the, in the terabytes per rack unit metric. Um, we support today 140 terabytes of raw flash in three rack units. Um, and this three rack units, we are delivering a million IOPS. So not only in that capacity terabytes per rack unit, but also in the IOPS per giga uh, per terabyte, um, and ultimately also the IOPS per rack unit as well as a dollar per IOPS, as Bill talked about, are all metrics that we've seen customers use where we, uh, we believe we have achieved significant leadership. Um, and obviously, IOPS is one metric, but what we see a lot of customers being equally very focused on is latency and the ability to consistently deliver sub uh, 500 microsecond latency has been uh, uh, very important for many customers as they're looking to take workloads uh, on the arrays and provide more performance um, and in many cases, this is where the transformation starts from an enterprise perspective. With the Flash Storage Platform 7700, we're able to scale the system all the way up to 1.4 petabytes of raw uh, capacity. 
We do this within a 36 rack unit footprint and deliver 2.2 million IOPS with, again, that pretty low latency uh, that customers uh, know violin for. Um, and through that, we're basically able to really offer customers a, a path of growth where as they putting more and more workload and data on the array uh, on Flash, able to seamlessly grow and adapt to that. If we talk a little bit more about the Flash Storage Platform 7700, one element of it is that it can scale seamlessly uh, without any uh, uh, interruption and very uh, uh, completely non-disruptive. But the other aspect uh, which we see a lot of customers picking the Flash Storage Platform 7700 for is the ability to, to build stretch clusters. So this is a, a typical deployment model where a customer would have a primary site in Manhattan and then they would be replicating off to the layer somewhere else in the state or in New Jersey. And this would allow them to actually do synchronous mirroring of the data between the sites, offering zero uh, RPO and zero RTO, um, which is really, uh, we've seen a, a becoming a more and more important uh, element in customers' decision criteria as they're looking for zero downtime zero data loss um, and the ability to really, um, you know, withstand any type of failure or disaster uh, situation. So with that, I would like to hand it over back to Scott and thank you for your time. Saeed, thank you very much. Um, it's always interesting to see what's happening uh, with violin. Uh, I, love, I love the direction that, uh, that things are going. And Bill, thank you for your insights um, into a real customer use case, which is, again, I think something that um, is critically important for people to hear. And we do have a few questions from the audience um, I'd like to ask uh, Bill and Saeed to, uh, to take. Again, if you have questions, please use the questions control panel and the go to webinar control panel because we'll be happy to, um, to, to talk about uh, any of the questions you have and so we can make sure that uh, you walk away with uh, the answers to everything you need. So one of the questions that we have um, is to Violin, and it basically asks, do you require a SAN switch? I mean, basically, it's probably a, uh, a dedicated storage infrastructure of some kind. Um, so the Violin systems are integrating in any existing SAN. Um, so typically, customers have fiber channel SANs. They typically have you know, other block storage arrays connected to this SAN. So Violin usually connects into these SANs. Um, and, and we just connect through those and offer the services. Uh, for the 7700, we actually are using uh, also a, a fabric of our own, so that is part of our solution and completely managed through that single pane of glass that was mentioned earlier. Another question is, um, what kind of reference architecture materials do you have available for people if they want to integrate with specific types of applications? So we have several reference architectures uh, available. Um, one of them, obviously, is VMware and uh, the ability to integrate in the VMware environment. We, we've also seen uh, customers leverage us for OpenStack uh, type of environments. We have an OpenStack driver, um, send a driver, and, and the entire uh, and, and tested with an open with the different OpenStack versions that are available. Um, and then beyond that, we we have also partnerships with companies like Citrix and others for VDI type of reference architectures, etc. Very good. And Bill, we have a question for you. Um, the question is basically when you evaluated your, um, your solution, uh, you looked, obviously uh, landed on the SAN solution from Violin. Um, did you look at also some of the, um, the hyperscale type of products and how do you feel about your ability to grow uh, as your business needs change with Violin? Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, we think that uh, it's going to be pretty easy for us to grow. Um, early on in our process, <clears throat> we saw that it's uh, with the two um, arrays that we purchased, it was very easy to integrate and to share data across those without any trouble at all. Um, we're, uh, we, we don't grow rapidly. We don't have uh, a large data growth in our databases and in in environments. Uh, we typically make big leaps when we acquire a company. So the uh, steady ability to add new components and add storage when needed as we acquire a new company and take on more computing uh, requirements, uh, we feel that we have that pretty well handled with a violin solution. Very good. <clears throat> 
Uh, you know, we have another question here. Um, this is really goes to, I think, the architecture again, but um, sh shared storage. I mean, you can work with just as well with physical machines as you can virtual ones. That's basically what the what the person is getting to. You have no problem integrating with a vSphere environment or a bare metal exchange environment or Oracle environment or something along those lines, correct? Correct. We've been deploying all these different in, uh, architectures, both with VMware as well as bare metal. That's right. And Saeed, um, some questions around data services, which we know is really a, a great frontier today in storage. Um, it's something that Violin has really um, spent a lot of lot of time on in the past few years, uh, adding to the platform. Um, can you talk a little bit about what customers are seeing when it comes to um, deduplication and compression? Some kind of some sort of customer stories. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a great question. So I think. Um, I think initially with, with the earlier introduction of inline deduplicate and compression in the market, I think uh, the expectations were very high. Um, we've seen a lot of customers initially ex over probably expecting the, the dedupe and compression ratios they could get on their specific data. Um, I also think that you know it, it, is not, it isn't always clear what the dedupe and compression ratios you get on depending on the workloads you put in. I would say that in the last nine to 12 months, we've seen customers kind of get better and better educated and understanding that inline DDoP compression is just a tool, not different than doing stretch clusters or doing any other capability. It's not by itself uh, a, a solution to all problems in the data center. So we've seen uh, a good adoption of that from, from our perspective, where we see customers, especially for virtualized workloads, um, take advantage of it. And then some customers, are, uh, we've seen even customers that are basically running their primary uh, site on, on a on a high performance launch, so no need, no compression for a database or LTP, but they're replicating to a remote LUN that is actually dedupe and compressed because that does not need that performance. So we're seeing customers as they're using the on the, the ability to turn on and off dedupe and compression as, as really an advantage. And we're seeing I think that is probably going to become a more key feature, the ability to unlock really the performance of arrays for certain workloads. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean being able to sort of take that performance hit out of the equation when you have um, something that really requires a lot of I/O can be can, pre can be pretty powerful. Yes, yeah, and we see a lot of customers nowadays. By the way, they take an, a non-dedupable workload and, and try to play with that as well, just to get a really good sense of okay, well, how does the performance of the system perform with and without dedupe uh, and compression? If if there is nothing to dedupe or compress, basically. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's that's interesting. Um, you know, for data protection. Um, oh, we have another question here. Just a second. I want to get this one in. So you're generally block-based, correct? What about file and object? Is that something that you can support as well? Um, today we are uh, block-based. Um, longer term, obviously, we're evaluating all the different functionalities continuously and, and talking to our customers and see how they would fit in a potential roadmap. Absolutely. That's based. Block-based fits a, a pretty wide variety of workload. In fact, I can't think of a workload that wouldn't work well with block-based in some way, shape, or form. So I can understand that as being the the, the, the default. And, and also, I think right now, I mean, databases and those type of environments, you know, those obviously are kind of blocked by by nature, uh, like Oracle and, and, and uh, SQL Server, et cetera. So I think that's just, I think Flash has just been adopted through block as a starting point, but it's definitely not the end point. Got it. That makes sense. When it comes to, um, you, you discussed briefly uh, replication and mirroring. Can you kind of expand on that just a little bit to help people better understand some of the high availability and disaster recovery capabilities that are inherent in the platform? Absolutely. Um, yes. So, so as, as, and, and maybe just to give a, expand a little bit more, as I said earlier, Violin was one of the first companies to ever ship an all-flash array. And, and because of that, we ended up actually being deployed in some of the largest enterprises doing some of the most toughest workloads. So very early on, we had a lot of push uh, from customers to make sure that our product supported MBU, uh, was highly available, everything was dual, if not quadruple redundant in the architecture. So earlier on in the flash days, I think the flash array days, there was a lot of focus around the system itself to be very highly reliable. Um, what we've seen in the last few years is as more and more workloads are being put on the arrays is that customers would like to start taking advantage of other capabilities like asynchronous replication, so the ability to take a snapshot and trans uh, transmit it over an IP network or to a remote site anywhere in the world. Um, obviously, depending on bandwidth and other things, you can you know you have to kind of engineer it correctly. 
Um, and then we've seen customers that came and said, well, we'd like something like more like continuous data protection or continuous data replication allow you to kind of journal the, 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 the changes to a remote site. Uh, so still giving us the opportunity to kind of be able to go back in time and recreate certain uh, um, uh, snapshots or recreate certain points in time. And then we've, we've seen customers that say, I, I do not accept downtime in my environment. Um, and a good example of one customer, they, they're a large R&D uh, company and, and they have thousands of developers working on these arrays and they want to make sure that whatever happens, even if the data center goes down, that that, that the engineers who are distributed across the world can always get to their uh, information. So, so we've seen stretch clusters being built there and, and very highly, uh, you know, mirrored architectures where every write gets replicated or mirrored to another place at the same time. You know, Saeed, one of the things on uh, one of your slides that you had was you had sort of the list of some of the models that uh, Violin has available from the FSP 7250 up to the 7700 for capacity up to scale. But, you know, when we, can you, it seems like um, it wasn't that long ago when Violin was really considered an enterprise play, but with those additional models, um, Violin can really co come down market a little bit to a mid-market or even an SMB in some cases. Would that be a, an accurate uh, statement? Absolutely, yes, uh, especially with the 7250 product, we, we've engineered a very cost-effective platform uh, that allows customers to start as low as 8 terabytes of raw uh, capacity, um, which through usable and effective, they're able to store easily 30, 40 terabytes on it and, that, and putting it at a price point that is very competitive to a similar size disk or hybrid array. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, do you have any other, uh, Bill or Saeed, do you have any parting comments for our audience today? Uh, I would just like to add that uh, we have only been doing uh, the violin storage for a few months and we're continuing to migrate our uh, databases and environments to them. Uh, but everywhere we turn, we continue to get uh, vastly improved performance and I just got a report this morning of a uh, process for one of our business units their key application month-end processing went last night and finished before midnight last night when normally it would run to a, as late as seven in the morning usually finishing up around five in the morning so wow. we got a tremendous boost on that and just keep chalking them up as we as we go that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, that's pretty compelling. Well, the uh, the key there is, you know, it's important to focus on IOPS and latency and things like that, but it really makes all the difference when you put it in place and you deliver to the user community in your environment high performance that they can appreciate and notice. Absolutely. Yeah, when, when user, you know, one of the things, I, I spent a lot of years as a, as a CIO, and I did a lot of infrastructure changes, and I always felt that when users would positively notice a difference, we did it right. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're, you're experiencing as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, funny enough, we actually call this internally the violent effect, but it's part of it is how much we are reducing in terms of data. And we've seen customers take out half of the servers to be able to do the same type of workload before just because of the lower latency and more efficient utilization of, of the servers. But at the same time, the delighting of, of, of the end user has been a common thread as customers move to Flash and, and suddenly things move faster, tools are better responding. Um, so that's great to hear that, you know, that's also something you guys are seeing, so. Very good. And we have no more questions, so we have three gift cards of $100 a piece that we'll be giving away today. And our gift card winners are Terrence Kung, Cheryl Anderson, and John Long. Actual Tech Media will be reaching out to you to fulfill those. And to all of our attendees, thank you very much for being here today. And especially thank you to Saeed and Bill for presenting today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. Bye.